Okay, so um, yeah, this uh, class is for Yom Rishwayim. I want to talk a little bit about um, Mashiach and Messianism um, as Rav Shigar contrasts it with science fiction specifically, and then more broadly, his sort of, uh, well, as you see, we might call it science fictional approach to Mashiach. Um, there's two pages of sources here, but if you notice the top of the, pa- the second page, there's a line. Um, we're not going on the other side of that line in this class because I just couldn't help myself from bringing all the sources, but that would take much more time than I want to spend on this. Um, so j- I want to start really with sort of a foil um, that Rav Shigar himself makes use of, which is the Rambam. Uh, the Rambam quotes this line from the, the Gemara and Sanhedrin multiple times, uh, I think it is Parish Mishnah, definitely twice in the Mishnah Torah, um, laying out a very simple approach to what the Messianic era would look like. The only difference between this world and the Messianic era is subservience to the nations. Um, and at any point, I have something unclear or uh, just, you know, you have something to interject, please just don't hesitate. Um, yeah, so this Rav Shigar sees as the basis for a very simple political Messianism, which is absolutely what Mashiach is in Tanakh, um, and mu- much of Tanakh anyways, and for the Rambam, Rambam, the end of Hilchot Moachim has this whole depiction of um, Mashiach as the, you know, heroic leader who fights the wars of Israel and brings the people back to the Torah and stuff, and it's a very human-driven process, very naturalistic um, on a personal note, it was like really there was a point in time where it was very important to me. This model of like we can you know drive the messianic era, we can bring redemption, whatever. In contrast to having grown up with Madrashim about the Beit Hamikdash descending from heaven and fruits the size of houses and things, um, so I've reached a point where that was clearly ridiculous, and this was something logical and it made sense and uh, very very much uh, struck me, and I felt like I could believe in some sort of messianic idea again. Uh, any thoughts so far? Um, so, this process of, you know, the human-driven Mashiach is, like, eminently rational. It's just, you can cognitive, like, not, you can cognitively work through all of the steps of this process, um, particularly now that we've basically seen this process happen. Okay? With the exception of, you know, all of the people coming back to, uh, you know, Judaism and the actual building of the Beit HaMikdash, we've sort of gone through a lot of what we would have expected for Rambam's messianic process. The whole fighting wars of Israel, um, you know, the, uh, the returning of people to the land. We don't have, like, a specific messianic leader. Um, but the process looks relatively the same, um, and as I said, it's thoroughly sort of imaginable, uh, and it makes a lot of sense. Um, that is sort of what Rav Shigar is going to want to push back against, um, not just because he sees it as you know wrong or whatever. I think it's actually a very important starting point for him, but because of w- where he sees the religious Zionist community has taken it. Rav Cook is really the one who took this otherwise almost secular idea of Mashiach that had not really persisted after the Rambam, uh, was not the sort of dominant messianic view, say, in the 1700s, um, and then it got really picked up by the secular Zionists, who didn't necessarily think of it as Mashiach, but certainly had this sort of utopian nationalistic drive, and Rav Cook was the one who managed to create a sort of religious version of that and make that sort of a guiding light of the... Uh, the religious Zionist community, certainly after um, the 67 war, it was very, became much more popular. Um, and that's what Shigars is going to be sort of responding to. Okay, um, so now I want to look at the second source, which is from Rav Shigar. Um, all of the Rav Shigar sources um, in th- this year are going to be from the Sefer Bayom Hahu. This is like 400 pages of Drashot that they put out um, on Chagei Yar, the holidays of Yar. It's a very Zionist book. Um, it goes through Yom HaShoah, Yom HaZikaron, Yom HaTzmut, and Yom Yerushalayim. Um, so these ones are from, if I recall, Yom HaTzmut and Yom Yerushalayim Drashot. Um, all of these translations are mine. And, um, yeah, we're going to look at this first one, which is the one that lays out Rav Shagar's sort of theory of science fiction and messianism. And then the other ones are less focused on uh, science fiction, but I think 
display the same science fictional impulse. Um, anyone want to read number two? I can do it. Sure. Great, cool. Yeah. yeah, just read the whole thing. Um, in order to understand these wondrous magical depictions, which are not of this world, we can look to a somewhat parallel literary phenomenon, science fiction. Both science fiction and the rabbi's homilies, or midrashim, about the future redemption describe an alternative, alternative world. This world's primary purpose, if we can speak of such a thing, is to lay bare the mystery, or mistorin, of our lives, aiding the collapse and destruction of our banal, boring, everyday life. In the rabbi's days, there were no rockets. The eschat eschatological homilies don't talk about distant galaxies or about worlds full of robots and beyond human creatures. However, they contain just as much magic and wonders just as, the, as great uh, science fiction contains. They provide the realistic possibility of a substantive alternative to this world, an alternative that, may, that many of the rabbis certainly thought, of, thought would arrive one day. In this way, the miraculous and the wondrous bursts into the world and disrupts its factual scientific stability. Okay, so um, as is clear from sort of what you guys uh, referencing here, he's talking about a specific approach to Midrash, to uh, Mashiach, that is very popular in a lot of Agadot and Midrashim um, from Chazal, but also throughout a lot of the Jewish tradition. Um, that's fantastic, to say the least. It's miraculous depictions. Um, he specifically references a Midrash um, before he, this quote that I uh, translated, that describes the rabbi's layout, you know, ten things are going to be different in the Messianic era, and the sun will heal people, and there will be fruit that heals people, and all kinds of stuff like that. And he wants to talk about, like, what's the, the value of that uh, depiction? Like, what does that depiction do for the person who believes in it? And this is something he lays out a little more in detail in um, an essay from Luchot de Shivrei Luchot. It's translated in the, the Magid volume, where he talks about the connection between um, uh, science fiction and uh, mysticism. He says that science fiction ha can have a mystical effect on the reader and help them achieve a sort of mystical experience. And the reason for that is what he lays out here, which is that science fiction, just like these Midrashim and Agadot, um, depicts a form of existence, some sort of thing, whether it's you know, a different world, vehicles, ways of being. Um, he references cyborgs and um, realities that like, put existences where people don't have individual consciousness. Um, all of that is something that's totally radically different from all, the way we live our lives. And then science fiction and Midrashim about Mashiach put it on our timeline. So that in the future, it's going to be different. Uh, and in that sense, it's a, it sort of reaches back towards our time and says the way things are is not the way they're going to be. Uh, they're putting a serious asterisk on um, the way things are right now. Um, so one thing is worth noting is that Roshigar is not like making this up out of nowhere, just sort of off his own experiences, starting in like the late 60s, um, there's a field of science fiction criticism basically devoted to this idea. Um, it was started by a man named Darko Subin, um, who called it cognitive estrangement. Um, and he used those two terms to, those two words to designate the combined concept of this estranging, radically different sort of idea and experience that is simultaneously placed as sort of connected to our world. He said you could cognitively like, see the connections between that and our world. Um, for him, what that meant was that the function of, like, technology in science fiction is that technology is the rational development from here to there, right? And that's why it happens in the future. That's the difference between science fiction and fantasy for him. Um, Suvin was very involved in trying to delineate science fiction as a specific genre. And some things are not science fiction, some things are, and you can determine that based on things that are both estranging and cognitive. Something purely cognitive would be realistic fiction, something purely estranging would be fantasy or myth, um, and then science fiction in the middle is cognitively estranging. Um, a lot of that has been really sort of questioned since Suvin. He himself eventually came out and said, you know, you can't really draw the lines that distinctly. Um, a woman named... Xiao Yang Chu uh, wrote a book called Do Metaphors Dream of Literal Sleep? Um, and 
as referencing Philip K. Dick's new Android's Dream of Electric yeah. Sheep. Um, and it, he, she argues that you can basically make a scale, a sliding scale from the, like, non-fiction to uh, fantasy, and it's all just different degrees of representation of estranging to non like, like, varyingly estranging ideas. Um, but I think the basic point um, is not really um, about, like, how you get to that representation and if you need to use the science technology for and technology to show that connection. In fact, I think Rav Shigar here in this piece about uh, Midrashim is really moving away from any question of science and technology because he's talking about Midrashim that are essentially miraculous rather than science and technology-based. So for Rav Shigar, what science, what science fiction is is just the depiction of something totally, like, different on our timeline. Um, and that placing of it in the future. And he contrasts that with myth and says myth does something similar by putting different ways of existing in the past, but it, because it's in the past instead of in the future, it's much less estranging. Um, thoughts so far? So wait, does he still... Does he still say that it's cognitive as well? I mean, like, yeah, it's in the future, but does he... Right, so in a sense, he doesn't use the terms cognitively estranging, but... For him, the cognitive aspect is the fact that it's in our future, as opposed to where um, Darko Subin said, you, you can see how you get to the future. Um, other people coming after him, there's uh, Carl Friedman, switched talking about a cognition effect, and, um, that science fiction frames itself as if it was connected to our reality without having to actually show you how to get there. Okay. Um, and that, I think, is much more accurate. Uh, no worries. Okay, so um, just to catch up quickly, um, we discussed um, Rambam and the naturalistic uh, messianism of secular Zionists and religious Zionists. Um, and now we're talking about Rav Shigar, who in uh, source number two uh, compared um, Midrashim about a very miraculous messianic era to science fiction and how what science fiction and these Midrashim are about for Rav Shigar is uh, a radically different future that is on our timeline and thereby uh, really questions the necessity uh, of our way of living our lives, that they don't have to be the way they are now. So uh, is he saying the catalyst for Meshepo is still a human catalyst, or is this now moving to a catalyst that's... Graham discusses that the Meshepo is very much something that we'll bring ourselves. Um, so Rav Shigar... I think doesn't really ever, um, that I've seen, make clear sort of dogmatic statements about the nature of Mashiach. I think he, uh, on one level he's much more concerned about, um, like, the effect, is what he's talking about here, the effect of Mashiach on our lives now. Um, but also he's concerned about the type of Mashiach we're looking for. So he's less concerned that, that it's, if it's a person or not a person or whatever, um, so much as... Um, and this we'll see when we look at the next uh, piece or two, he's very concerned about the like, purely s- political, secular form of uh, messianism that religious Zionism has accepted. Uh, he says, you know, I'm looking for the uh, messianism of the Kabbalists and the Jewish tradition, other than Rambam, uh, which he sees as really having looked for some sort of spiritual shift and a just different way of being. Um, for Rav Shigar, that's both on, like, connecting to God or the Torah or whatever, but also on um, issues of like, interpersonal relationships. So uh, one of the sources that we're not going to look at um, on the back of the page is from uh, a letter he wrote in 2007 for Yom Hatzmaut before he was very sick with uh, pancreatic cancer. Um, he died shortly thereafter. Um, and there, that letter is really all about like the, the vision of the prophets for a redeemed ethical society and hoping to get there as opposed to being satisfied with political redemption. But there's, a, there's an important distinction here, at least the way that I see it. When, when you talk about science fiction from a technology perspective, uh, those are things that mankind is the one that is responsible for doing. We make the cyborgs. The cyborgs don't invent themselves, or we make the things that make the cyborgs. When you're talking about the messianic era, I almost see it as two different things of 
the miraculous side, which is in some ways passive because God's going to be doing all of this, you know, all of these miracles, not us, as opposed to the political, which is in our hands, meaning we have the ability to reach the political level. We don't have the ability to reach the other stuff. And it's almost what's actionable, what isn't. What's, you know, should we be active about versus should we say sort of remain passively for God to come in and take over the rest? Wait, do you, th- you think that, it, that the... Well, what, what do you mean by the political? The political here about, let's say, Shibud Malchio. Like, we have a state uh, okay. and, you know, we, we, and, you know, we start keeping all the halakha. And if you're going to make that distinction about, like, the natural versus supernatural, you can also... I, I think as a corollary between what's active and what's passive, because you know there are people like you know certain places I went that say, well, for the messianic era we just need to do mitzvot and sit back. God's going to come in and do everything. And another approach is, no, you can't do that. We have to actively bring Mashiach through our own actions. Right. So I think I wouldn't draw the line along issues of natural and supernatural, um, so much as possible and impossible, mm-hmm. which I think are n- very often uh, identical lines. Okay. But I think. The important part of like, what Shigar is looking for here is uh, the natural things we might think of as impossible or simply stop thinking about as possible. Um, so like I said, he's very much looking for ethical change. Um, we're going to see one piece here that's going to um, address the issue of Yom Yerushalayim and the division of Jerusalem, or, or non-division of Jerusalem. Uh, and questions of how that works. And I think what's very important for Shigar is this very naturalistic uh, approach to redemption doesn't leave a lot of room necessarily for things that we're not used to. Um, it works, it sort of develops out of our, our present and he's worried that it won't be, we, are, we won't be open to possibilities we might develop. So, to use your example, we're not going to make cyborgs if we don't ever consider the possibility. Which, you know, might be a good thing. But, um, <laughs> like, he wants us to be open to possibilities of you know, society and individual existence different from what we're so, here so now. That there may be a different that the issue of the political is there's a fixed point and it's already there, and like you achieve it, you have it, as opposed to that's a that shouldn't be an end point. There should not be an end point. Essentially, is, okay. Like, there's a good argument to be made that if we decided to go build the Beit Hamikdash tomorrow, we'd basically have the Messianic era. Mm-hmm. Um, that was like. Some more people would need to be religious, and Rambam would be happy. Um, so, I mean, I mean, to to me, the messianic vision, um, like both in in Rambam, I think, and in, and in other people, is is a utopian vision, right? I don't I don't know if you used that word here. Yet. We did, but that's strongly connected to a lot of the science fiction criticism stuff I was talking about, like utopian theories and stuff. Yeah. So, so I mean. Like, like even even in Rambam and even even in like Tanakh, right? The thing about like the the lion lying or the the wolf lying down with a sheep or whatever it is. So all of these, uh, like, there was a very strong part of the messianic vision, which is about like um, domestic and political tranquility, and not not just she would. I mean, I understand that Rambam in like in this particular halacha says that it's just about she would but you know, in other places he. He, he has the other aspects of that vision. Well, it's funny you mentioned that example, because the opinion about there's no distinction is a machloket back in the Gemara, and it's contrasted, it comes up in Shabbos over whether or not weapons are genai or shavach, and there's an, or not shavach, like, you know, dormant or tachshit. And if I'm remembering right, the issue was the, the people who said, like, it's, you know, it, it's a mikunah, like, they're, they're discussing is because of, like you said, you know, the whole you know, lamb lied down with the lion and all that, and but that's machloka because the other opinion, you know, it's like, wait, but, you know, it doesn't also say that the only difference is Shibud Malchiot, which means that there you would still have wars, just political independence. So it's funny you gave that as the example here from Ramba when the opinion he's citing here takes the opposite position. Uh, but I think yeah. we're off topic. No, it's fine. I think, I think you're are, right. Are we off topic, though? Oh, no, I don't know. No, no, no. Well, I don't know how much was about Rav Shigar No, nah, it's definitely <laughs> fine. Um, <laughs> particularly because I think, as a Rav Shigar likes to play both sides of the coin when it comes to Rambam. Um, he clearly highly identifies the Rambam in a lot of places. Um, so when he's talking about 
um, this question of like rationalistic, uh, much more sober messianism versus uh, his own m- more grandiose sort of visions of messianism. Um, he likes to be against Rambam, but he has an essay exploring Rambam's uh, messianic discussions, particularly at the end of Hilchom um, Lachim. It's an interesting mm-hmm. read. And there, as well as a couple other places, he points out that, like, right, Rambam says there's not going to be any fighting and that everyone's going to be involved in, like, meditating on God all day. He's like, that right. is clearly just a shift in basic human nature at the very least. Uh, so I think Rambam gets abused both by Rav Shigar and other people who, I put myself in that camp at the beginning of this class, like, who see Rambam as purely looking for a rationalistic, uh, very natural, human-driven redemption, when I think there is a clear shift in Rambam's depiction, even if it's not clear how you get there. So, um, Professor Menachem Loverbaum wrote a book uh, called, I think, The Secularism and the Limits of Law or something, about... Rambam and Rabbeinu Nisim of Grandi's theories about the function of Torah and law. And he basically argues Rambam really thinks that you can get to that perfect society based on law. That law can get you to that harmonious society. Um, but I think that's not so clear from reading Hilchot Moachim. And I think there is an aspect of just radically different way of living um, and shift in human nature there. Okay. Um, anyone else? Okay. Um, I, wanted, I wanted to ask um, the other question. How does the how does the Gemara resolve that? Um, no, it doesn't. You've got a bunch of those different opinions. Yeah, uh, you've got a bunch of conflicting opinions about the Messianic era, about Olam Haba. I think it also shows up around Daf Tzadi Tet or whatever in Sanhedrin. There's just like a, a couple page Dafim of different opinions, and one of them is, you know, no difference, but the service to the nations, and one is just, like, a lot of them are just crazy differences and miracles and stuff. So, but what, so what does that do, do with the, the psukim, though, about the... the, the, the well, so they're di- well, so there's some they're different interpretations. I, mean, I don't think they address, like, every single one of them. Another approach is, you know, when you look at these midrashim, are they making a dogmatic predictive statement, or are they trying to teach some other method, a message behind it? Which is always tricky when you're dealing with Akadot. And also Rambam deals with them. He says, you know, those are just talking about, they're metaphors about ethical stuff. And you don't have to say there's some sort of miraculous shift for people to be nicer to each other. You get people just decided to be nicer to, to each other or learn to be nicer to each other or stuff like that. And I think, you know, you could make the argument that would require a miracle. But Rambam said you don't have to. Yeah, but I mean, kind of. Sorry, I'm, I apologize. No, no, no. It's good. <laughs> but like, like to me, it, the the view that you mentioned that, like, let's say that law can bring us to that place. I think that it's this is not like particularly like religious or or Jewish idea, right? I mean, I think that you know historically, lots of people have had ideas for how to con- construct an optimal society, um, and uh, you know, with with the belief that if you follow this set of principles. So you'll come to, to a state where everyone will, will be happy. I mean, you know, like Marxism to some degree is kind of like that. You know, all, all of these like social political um, ideologies, liberalism. And, um, and like to some degree there, there is truth to the idea that there are certain ways of organizing societies that are, be- that are better than others. And you can sort of like look at different countries in the world and you can see, well, these, these societies do things better and people behave better. And those societies, people do worse. And so to some degree... It is the, the idea that you can, if you organize a society properly, that you can attain something which is utopian, like, is not, like, so far out there. It's just, like, it's, it's messy, you know? Um, but it's not, like, totally Right. There. I mean, I think a lot of people have thought that. Um, I find myself to be overly cynical and pessimistic about the human potential for, I don't know, anything more than we're overall achieving, but... Uh, that's really what Rishigar is against. That sort of cynical pep- pessimism. Um, yeah, so I do want to note that Rishigar, as I sort of mentioned in response to your question, doesn't seem to really throw out the religious Zionist model. Um, the next piece we're going to look at is from uh, right around the time of the disengagement, when a lot of people were really in a crisis over the messianic model of religious Zionism. When we had a very clear model of, you know, this is what's happening, here's the next steps, they're going to happen, we're not going backwards at all, and suddenly the, uh, the, the disengagement really felt like a major step backwards, if not an entire derailment of the whole plan. 
And so Rav Shagar wants religious Zionism to religious Zionism to reopen the possibilities of what redemption could look like, uh, and that also is going to play into this broader picture where he thinks they haven't um, really imagined big enough. They haven't let themselves dream of the possibilities of uh, redemption. So this is a short little piece from the very end of an essay where he was, this is a little addendum to, to an essay where he addressed the issue of siruv pikuda, of uh, re, re, refusing orders, of disobedience. Um, you know, lots of people were saying, lots of rabbis were saying, if the army tells you to pull Jews out of their home, you have to disobey. Um, Rav Shigar doesn't do that. He, not because he thinks that you have to just obey the army in order for the army to work, but because he says that's essentially just a like sticking with the game of force that you're pushing violently back against the army and the government when they're pushing you violently, and that doesn't help anyone. All it does is leaves the strongest person in charge. Um, so in place of that, he says, um, to truly rebel against force, you must abandon it. The ability to abandon the game of force and violence is truly a messianic option. We do not dream of a time when the right power will win out, but for a time when power and might will not make right at all. We seek pleasure and not reality. This is true messianism. Um, so just a quick note, the pleasure-reality distinction he makes use of uh, more explicitly elsewhere is borrowed from Freud, uh, the pleasure principle versus the reality principle. Um, the basic idea, both... Um, here and just more broadly when Rashigar is using it is the question of like the good and what the like ideal what we could possibly imagine being the best form of existence versus reality as we see it before us. We're looking for something better than reality that we see before us. Um, and for what he's talking about here, that means the question of like force. Is society going to be run on force? In a, a different essay he really questions the viability of the modern nation state at all to be a messianic state because the modern nation state, he says, is built on force. Um, and for him, that itself is always something we need to be questioning in our messianic vision. That you shouldn't just accept that and let your messianism end there. Um, so yeah. I had a question regarding the heat Yes. Heat not good. By, by telling the soldiers just to listen to the army, isn't that still giving into some force and like at the end of the day the people who are like someone else is in charge and coercing you into doing something right no that's definitely true um there is a like if you take it out of the specific context of the military i think it's a little more confusing and just imagine two people who are in a fight telling one of them you know oh don't use force because you're still letting the game of force happen the other person's gonna just beat them physically right. and win the fight and I think what it means in a certain sense is taking the long game. Um, it doesn't feel like a good argument on its own for why you should follow orders or things, but if you say, oh, practically speaking, we should follow orders anyways um, for the sake of the army and unity or whatever that other uh, leaders were saying, then certainly I think the long view is that force itself is a bad thing and we should not be participating in that. And that's um, certainly Richard Gar's view. Um, so how does he address, like, all the positive uses of force throughout Torah, okay. including, like, the whole, you know, messianic war type thing? Um, um, so uh, he doesn't address that when he I makes this bottle. statement. No. Um, he does talk about other issues, like questions of slavery and the women, role of women and stuff like that. And I think you, and, you know, changing historical models of things. Um, so he uses Riff Cook's letter where Riff Cook talks about how what Western society has on the whole moved away from slavery, and that's a sort of divine revelation in history of the fact that slavery is a bad thing. Um, so you could make the argument that Rav Shigar is sort of participating in a much, certainly much more utopian worldview, and um, that that is sort of a historical revelation of the people who think force is just a bad thing. Um, you might also might make the argument that it's a sort of an extension of the line will lay down with the lamb. Um, that wolf will lay down with the lamb. That would be afterwards. Meaning, say, oh yeah, think about that at that time, but only after we wind up killing everyone else who would stand in our way. What? And it's very easy to have you know. No, you could definitely make that argument. I think you could also make the argument that the ideal form of redemption is not violent. 
Like, when even Gogu Gog. Magog is only violent because the non-Jews want, you know, to kill the Jews after they come back to the land. I mean, I, I, I tend to think of these things in, in terms of, like, prisoner's dilemma situations, right? So, you're, you're familiar with, um, you know, Roughly familiar? Anyone? Great. Yeah. I mean, I, the specific pris- prisoner's dilemma isn't, isn't really that interesting, but the idea is that when, when you have an iterated prisoner's dilemma... Um, uh, you I, lost I, me at iterated. Huh? You, you lost me over just, time. Yeah you, yeah, you play it. You play it over time so that like you can punish someone who who does something. And who they can respond to past. So events. right. Yeah. So so as as time goes on, the optimal solution for both parties is is to cooperate with each other, um, and that's that's true in like many many things in life. That um, you know sometimes there's an incentive in the short term to. Um, to not cooperate, and because like one person doesn't cooperate, then that changes the whole incentive structure of of the other party also. Um, so like the initial conditions matter a lot. But if everyone would would sort of coordinate initially that they would cooperate, so that that can often lead to like an optimal outcome for everyone. So and and this is true, I think, in in um, you know when it comes to war and um, like all all sorts of conflict. Uh, that if everyone, if you could get everyone to cooperate, it would be, it might be optimal. But people don't want to like give up their the advantage that they have. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, I think you could make the argument that he's going to be sort of pushing that direction. Um, there's a Joshua he wrote for Tishabov, literally right after the disengagement from uh, from Azab, and there he he talks about the importance of losing of being willing to, to lose. And he uses that phrase um, some other times where he talks about, like, religious Zionism be, um, have been capable of being the avant-garde um, aspect of Israeli society in its willingness to sacrifice and lose and stuff like that. Um, I think it's definitely um, a way forward that is <laughs> theoretically promising, but as you said, people don't like giving up on their uh, advantage. Okay, um, so we want to read number four. We're going to look at... This is at the very end of a drasha for Yom Yerushalayim, where he's talking about um, sort of sees as a different possibility for Yom Yerushalayim. Did you? Sure. Great. I don't know how to depict this re- redemption, but Rabbi Nachman's words inspire me to think that perhaps, if we stand vulnerable before God, this will enable a shift. Something transcendent will reveal itself. Something that is beyond difference. I am not talking about tolerance, nor about the removal of difference. The other that I see before me will remain different and inaccessible. And despite this, the divine infinite will position me by the other side. Again, how this will manifest in practical political terms, I do not know. But Yom Yerushalayim will be able to turn from a nationalistic day, one which has turned with time into a tribalistic celebration of religious Zionism alone, into an international day. Uh, Yeah, so one of the things I like about this is it points out that, like, the only people who celebrate Yom Yerushalayim are religious Zionists. Like, Haredim don't care, mm-hmm. secular mm-hmm. Zionists don't care. And it's not even right wing religious Not even right wing religious Zionists, mm-hmm. mostly just Americans, <laughs> and high school kids. Um, no, but like, religious, even a lot of religious Zionists would celebrate, but you know, because they're the only ones who celebrate it, they're not off work. Um, it's a very uh, particular holiday. That's in, inherent in, its, in the way it was created. It was created from a very nationalistic, very real, physical. But also no. religious. Yes. But again, like, it's, like saying, secular Zionists also don't really celebrate. But it's it. like I have a feeling it's like probably what Hanukkah felt like when they just conquered the Ibanim. Like they were because nowadays there's been the mysticism of the the eight nights and the creation and, and the war that went down. We see in looking back in twenty twenty hindsight that you know it was clearly a miracle going on fighting and defeating the Greeks. So I'm saying like you know in that way maybe again hundred so years on, same thing. That's actually fair. Like, when it comes to Hanukkah candles, uh, I think it was Rava who made the takana that if your house was on a corner, you had to have uh, Hanukkiyot on, like, both sides of it, lest someone walk by and think, oh, that person's not keeping right. Hanukkah. Right. Um, inter- does he say, like, something similar about this by, say, other Hagim? Because, like, a lot of people don't observe Shavuot. Um, yeah, that's coming up. Right, that's true. <laughs> um... In context of this specific thing, he talks a lot about uh, connections in the Midrashim between Yerushalayim and Shalom, or uh, Yerushalayim lo nilchal shvatim. It's not split up to different. Um, it's all tribes because it's meant to be a place for all tribes. Um, but that's also a matter of choice, in the sense that 
you know, you can celebrate. If everyone else chooses not to, is that the responsibility of the people who celebrate it to reach out to everyone else, or is it that everyone else ought to conform? It's a big question of achdos. Like, A conforms to B, but B could just as easily conform to well, A. Well, he's talking about here, and not, actually people not changing to be similar. Um, what he's talking about is, I think, well, people who celebrate it, what are they celebrating? Okay. Um, because the form that the, uh, was it religious Zionism, that religious Zionists celebrate, right, the form that religious Zionist celebrations on Yom Rishonim often takes is not just particularistic, but as he points, it, points out, tribalistic, uh, the Hebrew shifti, uh, that it's in fact very exclusive. Um, and is the exclusivity could, because they try to exclude others, or is it de facto exclusivity because no one else joins them? So I think you could make claims to different types of exclusivity. Um, so the the fact that secular Zionists and um, secular people who aren't even Zionist or Rocharedim of various stripes and people don't join in is really because they're choosing not to. But like when the uh, parade goes through the Arab quarter and is aggressive against anyone they see around or the doors, uh, like banging on the doors in the Arab quarter and stuff... Like, you can make the argument that's a different type of exclusivity. Mm-hmm. Uh, and r- that's really what he's all talking about here, is not just other Jews and other, you know, Israelis, but also um, Israeli Arabs and, and, other, and Palestinians. Those are the others he's talking about here. It's funny, because this, this, I mean, I think that people in Jerusalem, there are people who take this idea very seriously. So, like, this past year, and maybe in previous years also, there's a thing called um, uh, Yom Yerushalayim Alternativit, which is, like, exactly <laughs> that. In, o- in other words, like... Yom Yerushalayim, like standard Yom Yerushalayim, is, is like this this um, jingoistic, like religious Zionist holiday where people are like shouting racist things. And so the the idea of this alternative of Yom Yerushalayim is that it's supposed to be inclusive for all different kinds of people and Arabs, things like that. And there are, there are different events and. Um, well, that makes sense, considering you have, like, alternative Yom Kippur's, alternative yeah. Seder, so right. that makes total sense that that exists. Yeah. Well, it, maybe, because maybe, like, you might think that Yom Yerushalayim is really just, like, a religious Zionist thing, and there's no, there is no, like, broader sort of Jewish historical tradition, like there is with Pesach or something like that. Um, I, I don't, I don't know if there is a value in redeeming Yom Yerushalayim or Yom Yerushalayim being anything. So because, because Yom Yerushalayim, what, what's it about, really? Like, I, so basically, like, like the religious significance of Yom Yerushalayim is that people can dominate at the Kotel again, and that's basically it, as far as, as far as I know. Because West Jerusalem, people, like, you already had Jews in West Jerusalem. You don't really have Jews living in East Jerusalem now. You have a few. It's still mostly Arab. The Temple Mount is still under Arab control. So the religious significance is basically the Kotel. And if you think that that's important, so that's, well, the, that's what Yom Yerushalayim is about. The practical, like, day-to-day religious significance is the Kotel. Agreed, 100%. Um, I think... In terms of like broader messianic vision, I can understand the significance of like Israel, um, Jewish sovereignty over the Kotel and the Temple Mount, um, and you know the area of the old city and where the um, the Davidic palace was and things like that. Like you can s- feel the excitement when they find things in Ir David from two thousand years ago. Yeah, uh, look, look, I understand when it happened. It was very exciting. But now in 2018, when you look back at it and say, what, what has Yom Yerushalayim really done for the Jewish people? Well, if you, if you hold that it got us closer to actually having sovereignty over the whole area, and that's, that's the end goal, and eventually we're going to do the full land grab and annex all the territory, so, like, fine. But if you're not of that mindset and you think that... that we just have this like messy political situation that emerged from it, and we have no idea how it will end. So it's not like that that exciting. Uh, well, I think I think there can be value to celebrating messianism, uh, and I'm specifically thinking of the type of messianism we're discussing. Um, I think there are other types of messianism I would struggle with celebrating. Um, and I think having a day that we already celebrate messianism gives us the time to do that. I think it's much easier to adapt rituals and holidays that already exist than to, as opposed to creating your own. Um, so I think if there's a day to be aware of and celebrate the salvation of the Jewish people and the utopian vision for, you know, world harmony and religiosity or whatever, 
Um, I think if you already have a day roughly on that topic, that's a good day to do it. Right. But it's not really what Yomir Flame is about, which I guess is what Rothfigar wants. He wants it to be something very, yeah. very different. Now he's saying we have this holiday, and the agotic roots of Jerusalem are, would give me room to suggest a different meaning for it. Um, and just off the top of my head, he represents the, the Midrash splits the word Jerusalem into Yirah and Shalem. And he goes from Shalem to Shalom, and etc. Um, anything else on that piece? Okay, so that's kind of it for Rav Shigar. I want to look at uh, one last piece here, which is from uh, Rav Menachem Froman. Uh, part of the reason I want to look at this, beyond the fact that he was close to the Rav Shigar, and they're often of similar mind on a lot of issues, um, is simply that he was really much more politically active. I saw, I remember seeing a eulogy for him that, you know, said, as opposed to Rav Shagar, who was in the yeshiva, Rav Fruman was, like, on, you know, working in politics. Rav Fruman also passed away? Oh, uh, yeah, Rav Fruman passed away in 2013, 2014, mm-hmm. something like that. Um, and it's not entirely true that Rav Fruman was not in yeshiva. He taught the Rav Shagar in yeshiva in the 80s. Um, Rav Shagar, Steinsaltz, and Rav Fruman had a uh, yeshiva, um, it was the original Makor Chaim, before Steinsaltz opened the high school Makor Chaim, um, but it was called Shefa for uh, acronym Shigar from an um, Adin for Adin Steinsaltz. Um, and the uh, Reformant, though, was very heavily involved in um, politics and Israeli society to the point where there's like a secular woman who does, I think, a one woman show in Tel Aviv now commemorating him. Um, and just all kinds of involvement. He wrote very often in uh, secular journals. Um, I just found the book they put out of his short dress out and essay, or mostly essays, on um, Israeli society and politics and things, and they're mostly pulled from Haaretz and Habita On and some other um, things like that. Um, so he, uh, I think, was very, very attuned to questions of politics, but still has this same sort of utopian impulse. And I think that it very much has to do with this same like science fictional you know sense of dreaming and not being satisfied with politics as we've achieved it so far. Um, anyone else want to read number five? Sure. The way each side sees its way of thinking as natural and obvious closes them in on themselves. Open dialogue, never mind mutual understanding, gets farther and farther away. Perhaps the path to Jewish normalcy goes by way of abnormality. For example, to suggest a product of abnormal Jewish thinking, the idea that the Jewish world, which sees its land as its ancient homeland and its modern destiny, does not necessarily contradict the Palestinian world that sees this land as refreshing the cradle of its birth. For example, perhaps peace will not come about through mutual contraction of two cultural worlds, but through their expansion and sublimation. Um, so just a quick note on the terminology. What he sort of means by normalcy and abnormalcy is, as opposed to saying that, or is it the path to Jewish normalcy, meaning coming back to like the platform of history, becoming you know uh, a nation like all the other nations, um, is not going to be achieved through the normal path, which you consider sort of, you know, conquest and just settling and government and whatever, so much as some sort of abnormal path. And what's, what's the Hebrew? Um, I believe it was normaliut. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> um, it, yeah. Um, and this is going for that sort of same idea. It is, as opposed to, you know, everyone seeing their way of thinking as natural and obvious. Um, he, you have to sort of open up beyond that. Um, he says, the fact seeing the way we already see things are as natural and obvious uh, keeps us closed in on ourselves and rules out dialogue. Um, I just forgot to mention it before, so I think this is connected to what Rav Shigar does in that previous piece we just looked at, which is that he starts and finishes it with, I don't know how to describe this, or how to depict how we're going to get there. Um, it's the same instinct Rav Fruman is depicting here, which is, uh, we have to go via an abnormal path. The normal way is not going to get us there. So it's almost like, if, if I'm understanding all this correctly, it's kind of like John Lennon's Imagine. Um, yeah. Not necessarily all the details, but like, you have to imagine an ideal world, 
and then maybe you have a chance of getting there as opposed to... Yeah, no, I think that's, like, I think um, if the term that we was using before based on Suvin is, you know, that you can cognitively understand the way from here to there, you might say that represents a failure of imagination. Um, that, like, that you're, tr- like, only considering possibilities of things that could be worked out rationally from the current state of things towards the Messianic era, um, which certainly works for the more rational model. And, um... Hi. And, um... So there, he might suggest that, you know, you fail to imagine that things could be radically different. Um, and I just... A note about what he means here at the end of this is opposed to the uh, um, peace coming about through the mutual contraction of two cultural worlds, but uh, instead it'll come through the expansion and sublimation of those two cultural worlds. Uh, he's saying instead of the two-state solution, which will involve everyone sort of deciding, I guess I can let you have that space, um, you'll have expansion and sublimation, which he means a binational confederation. Uh, he was one of the big people pushing for a grassroots movement and talking explicitly about Jews living under Palestinian authority and uh, sovereignty and um, stuff like that, eventually moving really away from the idea of states in general um, to just people living on the land. Um, and I think probably the best critique of that is that it's just a, like, totally non-practical and doesn't take the you know, facts into account. And I think Rafferman would say yes. <laughs> like I think that's his whole point is that, th- yet yeah, it's cr- a crazy thing to imagine that people might be okay with a radically different understanding of politics in the land we call Israel or Palestine or both. Um, and you have to be a little crazy if you want to maybe get to peace. Would be sort of the argument from this uh, passage. I, I don't think his. I, I mean, like I've I've always been a fan of the general Froman sort of approach to the, the, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Like, I don't think it's that crazy. I, I think that, um, I mean, it, it, it's, crazy, it's crazy because people are, are ideologues. But from a, from a political standpoint, it's, it's feasible, right? Like, there are Arabs who live in, in Israel under Israeli political rule, and you can have Jews who live under Palestinian political... Like, it's not, it's not totally nuts. Um, Right, I, I, I think, I think the, the problem with him is actually more from the religious standpoint. Uh, like, if, if he is speaking as a, as a person who's talking about messianism, you know, the traditional Jewish messianic view is that Jews have complete sovereignty over the entire land of Israel as demarcated by the biblical borders, um, you know, under a king. Right, so I think um, you, might, you sound like you're entirely right. Um, it's not something I'm an expert in. He looks like his full political theory, so I'm not going to make too strong a statement. But minimally, like, based on what we've seen right now, I suggested earlier that Ruf Shigar um, wants to sort of critique the naturalistic political model for just stopping and saying, you know, they have to keep imagining a redemptive uh, spiritual possibility. It sounds like Rav Froman might be willing to give up on the political possibilities almost entirely. Um, and you're right, that it's a... Like, there was never a part of the Jewish tradition that gave up on uh, political redemption, at least as a, as a you know, ideal. And it sounds like Reformin's willing to. So um, that's really interesting. Um, he's, he does clearly want Jewish people living in the land of Israel, but he's not, doesn't seem to be strongly committed to Jewish sovereignty in any sense. Right. I mean, or you could, you could just say that, you know, we can, we can sort of wait for... If, we can wait yeah. for Mashiach in order to have the Messianic era. But yeah. in, in the meantime, uh, you know, what we should be, right. we so should that's, be working towards. That's definitely uh, also true. The one, like, question might be, so this piece he's talking about the path to Jewish normalcy, to the Jews living, you know, in their land, Kichol HaAmim, um, is he saying that removed from any sort of Messianic um, te- connotations that certainly has in religious Zionist discourse? Religious Zionism has always seen like the Jews living in their land as a messianic thing. Um, is he pushing that off to the future? Which he, which he very well might be. Right. Um, one of the ways of Shigar makes it very clear that we can be okay with the state not being religious and don't have to either deny that or be upset about it is because we can accept the fact that it's not the messianic era now. Um, and that we're not responsible for it being the messianic era right now, which is a step away from a much stronger religious Zionist messianism. Which is probably dangerous. 
the stronger version is dangerous? Or I, the, I have the strong, stronger versions of religious line that masculinism, masculinism are dangerous. That's like ISIS. <laughs> um, like, I think that comparisons to ISIS are both correct, and Rishagar makes them. Well, he, he, ISIS wasn't around. He compares religious line to Hezbollah, and he says that secular people see it as Hezbollah, and that is a logical thing for them to see. Um, without saying that religious Zionists would actually kill people like ISIS. Like, you're not... Uh, I have trouble believing you would see religious Zionist beheading videos, but certainly all of the ingredients are there um, with some of the more extreme forms of messianism. And hey, it, it does exist in religious yeah. Zionist community. Yeah. We have people I, who do things like that, so it's not... Well, yeah. yeah. I think we could, we could argue if the difference between, you know, the most violent religious Zionists and... Um, beheading videos is one of like quality or quantity <laughs> um, but I think that our dis- disagreement is not strong yeah right. um, cool. anyone else have any questions comments thank you All right, I think that's it thank you